Hi everybody, this is Dr. A, and in this video on serology, we are going to go over the basics of body defenses. So the first of the body defenses are your microbiota. So the host microbiota and the immune system interact to maintain tissue homeostasis in, in healthy individuals. Uh, whereas the disruption of the host microbiota, especially in the gut, is associated with many autoimmune diseases and just dysfunction of the immune system. So the normal biota or normal microbiota, which was previously called normal flora, these are bacteria that are usually found in certain parts of the body, such as the throat and the intestines, but we really have them all over. Um, these microorganisms will deter the penetration of other organisms that are pathogenic, or uh, they will facilitate the elimination of foreign microorganisms from the body. So basically, these have claimed um, a territory on our body, and they are helpful and they're protective, and um, as long as they have claimed territory on our body, then, and they're present and they're healthy, then they can push away the pathogenic bacteria and just, you know, keep them at bay. And so um, this is definitely a huge part of health. And um, even the Greeks knew this many thousands of years ago uh, because they say all diseases begin in the gut. And where is our, the biggest part of my, our microbiota is in the gut. So you, if you want good health, you need to have good gut health. Uh, and there's also um, kind of behind the work that we've been doing in health with probiotics and, um, you know, recognizing that we need something sometimes to beef up our normal microbiota. Um, diet is a big influencer of the microbiota, more so I would say than probiotics, um, but sometimes probiotics can be helpful too. Uh, it's just finding like which strains are helpful, which you know which strains do nothing, um, and so we're still doing a lot of research on that. The first line of defense then is going to be any um, unbroken skin and unbroken mucosal membrane surfaces. So this is you know your covering where you interface with the outside, and as long as that is intact, then uh, it does keep bacteria and viruses and other things from entering your body. And in addition to the unbroken surface, you can also, you also have secretions in there, such as mucus, earwax, which is called cerumen, galactic acid and sweat, stomach acid, saliva, and tears. All of these things work with the unbroken skin and the unbroken mucous membranes to keep bacteria and other pathogens at bay and outside of our body. Then you have your second line of defense. This is your natural immunity. So this is a a type of immunity that you're born with. Um, and um, so this natural or innate or inborn resistance is one of two ways the body will resist infection if a microorganism has penetrated that first line of defense. If so something has gotten into your body, they will um, encounter the second life line of defense first. So the um, natural immunity is very non-specific. So it has particular cells such as neutrophils, your tissue basophils, and your macrophages, and certain soluble substances in the blood that help fight off pathogens. The substances are going to be the complement, lysozyme, interferon, etc. So those all together are kind of a, um, a first reaction or first uh, encounter with the pathogen once it has breached our barriers. And then the third line of defense is our acquired or adaptive immunity. And this allows the body to recognize, remember, and respond to a specific stimulus, a specific pathogen, so uh, an antigen that it has seen before. And or if it's never seen it, to mount an appropriate response to that specific pathogen or antigen. Uh, and so um, we're going to expand on this acquire or adaptive immunity because there is a lot there. Just think of it as a very targeted response, um, more like of a sniper attack versus a, a troop blitz, basically. 
So there are a couple of classifications of the acquired or adaptive immunity and can be active or passive. So in active immunity, the host produces the antibody because the host or us, right, has, has encountered that foreign antigen. And uh, this results from the natural exposure in response to a natural infection, or it could be from an intentional vaccination with an antigen-bearing microorganism. So either way, whether it's through a natural process or through immunization, your immune system, system is confronted with a foreign antigen, a pathogen that it has to mount a reaction to. And so um, the immune system is stimulated and the production of antibodies will ensue. Uh, and, you know, in a person that's been um, either infected or vaccinated against that specific pathogen. And that active immunity lasts. It has memory. Um, it lasts for a long time. Passive immunity, the host does not produce the antibody. So the, the host immune system does not see the pathogen, does not react against the pathogen. Um, and so how does it, it, it become, it comes passively. So the antibodies come preformed from an outside source and are either put into our body through an artificial means. So that would be an infusion of antibodies or they're put into our body from a natural process. And the only natural process that does that is uh, pregnancy from mama to baby and then breastfeeding from mama to baby. Uh, and baby receives preformed antibodies that the mama has made, and it protects the baby against all those infections that mama has antibodies to. Um, and so that is um, part of, so that's passive immunity. So it's pa passive on the baby's end, or passive on the recipient end of the recipient of an artificial infusion of serum or plasma. Um, to receive those preformed antibodies. Antisera against uh, snake venom, for example, is a would be a passive infusion of antitoxin antibodies to neutralize the uh, venom of the snake. And then you have humoral mediated immunity, also as a subclass of this third line of defense. And um, humoral is always referring to the production of antibodies and it is a primary defense against bacterial infections. So um, this antibody production, uh, this response can be natural and active, artificial and active, natural and passive, or artificial and passive. And so I've already introduced all of these concepts just in that previous slide. So natural is a natural process, so getting sick is a natural process, and, and active means that the immune system is activated. So you get sick, you get a cold, you get COVID or something like that, you will get natural active immunity against um, you know, the pathogen you get exposed to. Artificial and active is vaccin vaccination. So you're artificially or through a medical procedure, you are exposed to a foreign antigen, a, a virus particle, a bacterial particle antigen or something, and your body mounts an immune system reaction to it and you produce your own antibodies against it. And uh, natural and passive is um, passive is receiving the preformed antibodies in a natural through a natural process. So that's mama to baby um, in utero and then from breastfeeding. And then artificial and passive was through a medical procedure given preformed antibodies. So that was um, a medical infusion of antibodies, antisera, um, you know, the antibodies to, to COVID. Those are, you know, some, uh, some of the things that you know, can fall into that category. So the mechanism of humoral mediated immunity is always antibody mediated. The cell type that makes these antibodies is the B lymphocyte, um, often referred to as the plasma cell. Uh, and it's not the predominant lymphocyte in the body. Um, it's only about 20% of the lymphocytes in the body. And uh, it produces antibodies um, in plasma soluble products. And so this is what antibodies look like. This is what plasma cells, B cells look like. And this is an antibody tagged onto a bacteria. Then you have cell mediated immunity. So uh, it is responsible for quite a few body defenses. It is responsible for contact sensitivity, such as your sensitivity to poison ivy or poison oak causing poison ivy dermatitis or poison oak dermatitis. 
It's responsible for the uh, immunity to viral and fungal antigens. Um, so think about it, um, the viruses go inside of our cells to duplicate. So really the immune system has to be able to attack the cells that have been infected with viruses. So that's what cell mediated is the immune cell to body cell to you know, virally infected body cell or to a eukary eukaryotic cell like a fungal cell versus uh, bacterial, which is prokaryotic. And so antibodies work better against bacteria, but cell-mediated immunity works better against uh, the eukaryotic cells um, that are in our cells, our body cells that are infected with uh, viruses or um, just straight-up fungal cells, fungal antigens. Um, and it's also the rejection of foreign tissue and grafts because those are you know, fully formed organs and tissues made of foreign cells, of the donor cells that are implanted inside the recipient's body. Um, and so the recipient's immune system could legitimately see that as foreign, because it is, and attack it. So um, the cell-mediated immunity is moderated by uh, the T lymphocytes and the phagocytic cells, such as the monocytes macrophages. So it's a whole dance between um, the monocyte macrophages, which serve as antigen-presenting cells, and the T helper cell and the cytotoxic T cell. The T helper cell is the, the go-between. Um, it really is like the general that commands all of these reactions um, because um, the T helper cell can interact with the monocyte macrophage and then it can activate the cytotoxic T cell, but the T helper cell can also activate the B cells to make them into plasma cells and produce antibodies. Um, so the mechanism of cell mediated immunity is that it is cellularly mediated. So it is a cell of the um, lymphocyte, um, you know, of the cell of the immune system attacking a either a body cell that's cancerous, infected, um, you know, defective in some way, uh, or it's a big cell that's a foreign cell or a fungal cell, um, yeast cell, something of the sort. Uh, the predominant cell type that does this is a T lymphocyte. Um, if you look on the lymphocytes in your blood, these are T lymphocytes. Um, lymphocytes are about a third of the white cells in your blood. And then if you look at those T lymphocytes, chances are 80% of those are going to be T cells. It could be T helper or, or cytotoxic T cells, but they're going to be T cells. And then only about 20% are going to be B cells. And their mode of action is a direct cell to cell contact, uh, as shown here in this diagram uh, of like the, the T cell against the body cell infected with viruses, or um, um, the immune cell can secrete um, uh, little uh, chemicals that are going to cross in, over and kill the, you know, the infected cell. And so, uh, and also attract other T cells and you know, immune cells to the area. Now let's talk a little bit about hypersensitivity. So we have um, type 1, type 2, type 3, and type 4 hypersensitivities. All hypersensitivity reactions are um, really considered overreactions of the immune system. So let's start with type 1. So type 1 can range from a life-threatening anaphylactic shock um, to the milder manifestations associated with food allergies and environmental allergies. So the anaphylactic shock is the allergic reaction that people can have to bee stings or to peanuts or to strawberries or something where it will cause their airway to swell and their blood pressure to drop and it can it can kill them. Okay, so this is where this is a life threatening allergy. Now the other ones, some of the food allergies that are not the peanut or strawberry, but like uh, allergies you know, allergies to like dairy, gluten, um, grains pork, beef, different proteins that are in food, um, and environmental allergies like hay fever, allergies to pollen, dust, etc., tend to give you reactions such as uh, maybe some GI uh, reactions, you know, uh, GI cramping and diarrhea if it's a food allergy, um, but also it can, um, even if it's a food allergy in the gut, it can give you congestion or runny nose or watery eyes or itchy uh, itchy ears is one thing too um lots of sneezing just so you know think of reactions also to pollen you know the sneezing anything you would take benadryl for with histamine release that's pretty much what we're talking about with this type 1 hypersensitivity the antibody that's involved in type 1 hypersensitivity is the ige antibody 
and it's always an immediate reaction. And by immediate, we mean that following exposure within minutes, you start seeing a reaction as late as even like maybe 30 minutes. But, you know, the reactions, are, this is considered immediate. Now, in the type 2 hypersensitivity, uh, it results from either IgG or IgM that can bind to the surface of cells. So um, it can be antibody-dependent, complement-mediated, cytotoxic reactions, such as a transfusion reaction. So an ABO reaction would be one, but also an IgG, um, you know, immunoglobulin IgG reaction in uh, an incompatible, AB, um, incompatible blood type that's non-ABO. So a kill or DEFI or something like that. Um, and so um, the antibodies tag onto the cells and then cause a cytotoxic reaction so cells get destroyed. So your typical, you know, transfusion reaction is a type 2 hypersensitivity. It can also be antibody dependent, um, cell mediated without the activation of complement. Um, and so some, some of the autoimmune uh, uh, diseases are, are in this type 2 hypersensitivity. Autoimmune hemolytic anemia can fall into this category also. Uh, some of the lupus reactions are also type 2 uh, hypersensitivity reactions. We're going to talk about, they're also type 3. Um, we'll talk about that in a second. And then you can also have antireceptor antibodies that disturb the normal function of the receptors. So, uh, such as in Graves' disease or myasthenia gravis. So again, this is an autoantibody, but it's, it, it binds on the receptor. So for example, in the case of Graves, the antibody binds on the TSH receptor and then the thyroid cell reads it as TSH binding and then it produces more thyroid hormone and then you have an overproduction of thyroid hormone um, in Graves' disease. In myasthenia gravis, it binds on the acetylcholine uh, receptor and uh, keeps the um, the molecule, lasting choline molecule, from binding on there and having the effect. And um, type 3 hypersensitivity, uh, it is caused by the deposition of immune complexes in blood vessel walls and in tissues. Um, so good pasture syndrome is one of those where it, it does that. So the immune complexes deposit in the basement membrane and then you have Im other immune cells like neutrophils that see that and start, start trying to remove them, and as they remove them, they actually destroy the basement membrane and stuff. And so this is all IgG-mediated, so there are IgG immune complexes. Um, and this is one of the primary mechanisms in lupus and in rheumatoid arthritis. And then your top four hypersensitivity are um, cell-mediated, so they're not antibody-mediated, so that's the only one that's not antibody-mediated. And it includes contact sensitivity, so poison oak, poison ivy, um, reaction to metals like a uh, nickel allergy, uh, the delayed hypersensitivities. So uh, a delayed hypersensitivity, just think of it kind of like you think of poison ivy, poison oak. It takes 24 to 48 hours for you to see the reaction. Um, some food allergy reactions are that way also. So some of them are immediate reactions like IgE mediated, and then some of them uh, are, are delayed hypersensitivity reactions and um, you don't really see the reactions till you know a day or two later. There's also immunity to viral and fungal antigens is all that's under cell mediated like we've already talked about semi, cell mediated immunity uh, if this overreacts and you have a type 4 hypersensitivity reaction. So your rejection of foreign uh, organs and tissue grafts uh, but also the elimination of tumor or antigens bearing um, neoantigens. Um, and um, so organ transplant rejection is definitely a top four or a delayed Im um, immune reaction. And it's a cell-mediated uh, immunity reaction. And then lastly, we have our immunological disorders. Um, so they can be primary or secondary. So your primary immunodeficiency disorders are genetic disorders, they're inherited. They can be of the innate or the adaptive immune system. So if it was the innate immune system, maybe it's missing uh, one of the white cells, maybe it's missing neutrophils or it's missing monocytes or some of these missing components of the immune system, or maybe missing some of the natural killer cells or the um, innate IgM antibodies. And if it's um, of the adaptive immune system, either it could be missing entire lines, it could be missing the T cell line or the B cell lines, or certain 
types of, you know, maybe it just misses the, is missing the cytotoxic T cells, um, or it can be um, not able to produce certain classes of immunoglobulins. Um, and so there's a whole bunch of them, uh, and um, they're diagnosed, uh, you know, through testing, but also uh, partly by, like, what types of infections are happening um, and they keep occurring and um, the baby or you know child can has have a hard time fighting them off and then your secondary ones are uh, the result of, of a disease process that causes a defect in normal immune function which then leads to either a temporary or permanent impairment of one or multiple components of immunity in a patient so an example is HIV AIDS the HIV virus infects um, the, some of the lymphocytes, also monocytes, but uh, it basically cripples the T helper cell, which we saw is um, very important in the immune response. And um, as it cripples the um, T helper cells and those go down in number, the ability to mount an immune response uh, just deteriorates and the patient can fall into the AIDS uh, syndrome. And a temporary one would be um, chemotherapy and radiation therapy um, because that depresses uh, all the cells of the bone marrow and so you're missing multiple components um, of those cells in the immune system uh, as long as the chemo or radiation therapy is going on. But usually once chemotherapy or radiation therapy stops, the bone marrow is often able to um, rebuild. And if not, then um, you would be looking at a bone marrow transplant to correct that. So there you go. All right, so that wraps up our body's defenses. And um, I'll have one more video um, following these that I'm adding is um, on um, testing for specific diseases. And then I have a whole series on hepatitis testing um, all already uploaded on the channel. So I hope to see you there, and I hope this is helpful to you.